what is the what is the best way to explain what the fundamental product in the information age is going to be? I, I, I hate to, to so the fundamental product is going to be what people buy. <laughs> we're still going to need material production. We're still going to need air. Huge quantities. Yeah, you'll have but, huge quantities of it. But those things are going to be produced more easily and with less human resource. Mm -hmm. So what the fundamental pro uh, product? Well, what, be, what what's the largest industry in Central Florida? Entertainment. Huh? Entertainment. Entertainment. Tourism. Tourism. Services, yeah. not it may well be services. It may be the layer beyond services. It may be developing virtual reality games. Maybe being a game master. I can teach you how to play virtual reality faster than anybody else. And for five thousand dollars, you know, I'll be the equivalent of a ski instructor. You know, come to me because because the games get to be so sophisticated. It may well be entertainment. I mean, look at Nashville. Look at Atlanta, which has become a fairly big music center. Look at the amount of money for Jurassic Park. It may be producing items of self-identity. You know, I, you wear a certain kind of t-shirt. Why? Because you want to belong to the group that wears those t-shirts. I mean, the truth is we don't really know what's the other side of this. And that's part of why entrepreneurship and the idea of a free market, where the market defines where you're going. I mean, who could have guessed that Coca-Cola would be the most widely known single symbol of the industrial age? But it is. I mean, more people across the planet recognize Coca-Cola than any other trademark. You could never have predicted that in 1870. Look, it's kind of interesting that when you when you look at these various ages and changes, all the things in hunter gathering and agriculture and industry have to be accomplished. These things don't go away. It's, they're just more easily accomplished. Oh, but if, but if you had said but if you had said at the beginning of the industrial era that only three percent or less of the country will grow food, the answer would have been, gosh, we'll have ninety-five percent unemployment. Yeah. And if you had said at the beginning of the industrial era, at the, at the high point of the industrial era that will be down to 17% of the population manufacturing goods. I mean, in fact, I can show you all the static models where people said, where by looking backwards, people said, my God, we'll all be unemployed. It's turning out, by the way, the information age doesn't mean what John Kenneth Galbraith said in the affluent society, more, more leisure time, people who are bored. Turns out you work longer hours. You are more absorbed by your work, but you tend to find a job you like. So you tend to self-select, so you end up, you know, you say, what's your hobby? You're, for a lot of people, their hobby is their work. They like what they're doing. It's the game they want to play. And they'll play it for absurd lengths of time. You almost have to wean them from it. You know, quit doing it. Go away for a week. And it's not necessarily because they're, game, you know, in, in the industrial era, people did that to score high. They wanted to make more money. A lot of people do it now because they love it. I mean, but I want to do my business. You know, this is who I, they identify themselves with what they do. Brother theories become obsolete as well with this, with the information age, because it's not. So you much mean the state, state telling you, Big Brother, in the sense of the state telling you what to do? Well, not so much that Big Brother being able to track what you do. It seems like it's now it's more Little Brother. We can we can access what you guys are doing now. You, you sure. see what I'm saying? It may be. I mean, it may be that everybody can track everybody, in which case you'll be tremendously bored. <laughs> because it turns out most people don't do all that much stuff you want to know. Uh, <laughs> but, but. It also means that the government can track every credit card, every phone call. That's what I was saying. And so you, you, then, you then have to discipline yourself with things like the Privacy Act and say, yes, we could, but it will be illegal. We will not do it. And it also turns out, by the way, that in, in, in the scale of an information society, you have so many ways of communicating that a government capable of tracking everything you do would itself be so confused by its information that we don't know how to organize it. So that in a sense, uh, Gorbachev found that he had less information over time, not more. Uh, look, look also at the notion, which is fairly self-evident, of the spirit of invention and discovery in creating a third wave. I mean, obviously, Bill Gates is a good example, but so is Spielberg uh, and George Lucas. Uh, so are the people who are developing the biotechnology of the 21st century. So, are, uh, so is the development of, of the DNA and the double helix and Watson and Crick's work on, on inventing modern biology. You know, and so you get the tremendous spirit of what's coming next. That is particularly important as you enter this kind of an era. I mean, in a stable high civilization, in, in the Roman world, there was remarkably little invention and discovery by our standards. In our era, we are exploding the rate of research and, and, and uh, the number of things we're learning. It also means, and I think that, that Deming in this sense is a very transitional figure, that quality and profound knowledge are key parts of the transformation from industrial era to information age. And in fact, what Deming is do was doing was creating the first systems insight into the most powerful patterns of the uh, information age. The kind of teams that Deming is describing, the kind of human interaction, the notion of continuous improvement, 
is a very big part of where we're going. In this framework, what you need to ask yourself goes through a series of questions. First of all, individuals, you and your life. And you can literally sort of put a page in, in your notebook and stuff, start just making notes. How will this affect you? How will your life be different? Second is, how does it affect families? What's the structure of families? In a, in a, in a sense, we may be rebonding extended families because the telephone and the fax and the email allow a level of communications that rebonds us. And as the cost of transportation drops, we fly to see each other more often. Or we drive on the interstate. So that in a sense, we may be rebuilding an extended family in a different way. We're also inventing electronic families in electronic neighborhoods. Most of you are not as close to the person who lives next door to you as you are to somebody on your telephone list. You live in an electronic neighborhood. If I ask you to tell me the 20 people you talk to most often, it will not include the person next door. That's, almost, that's true for almost everybody. And you can try that out as an experiment. I mean, start down the list of who do you, you know, just keep track of who do you talk to in a week and see how far down you have to get before you get to one of your physical neighbors. And you'll be very surprised. But, we live so, but it's not that we don't have a neighborhood. It's that our neighborhood's now electronic. Which, which gets us to the whole notion of volunteerism in the third way. We may have all sorts of new ways of coaching and helping and working with each other. You know, and it may well be a lot more of it's by telephone. I, mean, I don't know of how many places have tutoring by telephone, but it could be done very easily. I mean, you know, kids who talk on the telephone all the time could be tutored on the telephone. You can actually you have, you have senior citizens in Florida who, when they get bored, are tutoring kids in Detroit, and the cost is, is trivial compared to that kid not learning math. They might only meet once a year, but it's the whole notion of weaving together new patterns, which also leads then to business and job creation in the third way. I had a woman come by last night who, who has invented an entire environmental recycling company out of boredom. She was tired, she put it, her children were growing, she was tired of shopping, and she believed in the environment, so she, began, she went out on her own using the local library, found a particular uh, recycling possibility, created a product, sold it to Disney and Coke, and is now off and running creating t-shirts out of Coke bottles. Uh, the, the two liter Coke bottle has a plastic that can be reprocessed into fiber. The fiber can be used exactly like cotton. And she now has an entire company that, that, that she built out of her uh, one room in her house. And that's that process of creating new jobs. Which, by the way, then means you can start talking about local government. I mean, Government is a lagging indicator of the third wave because bureaucracies don't face the same pressures and they have no incentives for change. But you could revolutionize virtually every small, every local government, every school board, every county government, every city government in this country could be revolutionized. And then you have state governments where we're beginning to get some impact. But state governments are a tremendously long way from being as efficient as American Express or as customer oriented as McDonald's or is able to deliver per dollar as Federal Express. So think about state government in the third wave of information age and, and what could it be like if you made the transition? Because you'll find governments rival I, the academic world and part, some parts of medicine is among the most trapped in a frozen environment and the most <coughs> resistant to thawing. And what you're looking for is how do you get through this process of thawing uh, and, and get people to start breaking down. And then, of course, the, the area where I'm most directly involved is what is, what is a third wave information age federal government like? You know, and, and, and what would you do to, to and, and that's where, frankly, Vice President Gore's reinventing government is asking the right questions, whether you agree or disagree with the details. He is beginning to put us in the right direction of saying, look, we've got to rethink this whole thing from the ground up. But it's beyond the United States. There are implications of the emerging third wave information age for the world system and for national security. That's part of why uh, I mentioned Toffler, Alvin and Heidi's book, uh, War and Anti-War. Because you got to think about, you know, what would have happened if Saddam Hussein had hired 10 hackers at the beginning of Desert Shield and had decided to electronically try to break down American systems? Not killing people, not setting off bombs, but for example, issuing 500,000 new American Express cards. 